If Arsenal are guilty of anything, is of inexperience again in the Champions League. I, I thought they played buying the name rather than buying the game. We could start with either game, quite frankly, in the Champions League, because both were absolute barn burners. We keep using that expression, barn burners, Jim Campbell. We're very happy to use it. But we, I suppose we're duty-bound to start with Arsenal uh, against Bayern. It was 2-2, of course. Uh, you were there, and presumably you had an interesting time. It was a good game to watch, but the outcome? Yeah. What are your feelings I, on it I, all? It was an emotional uh, evening for mm -hmm. me, uh, sure to say. Well, you love seeing um, Eric Dyer again. Well, in indeed. It was just <laughs> nice, nice to see him again. Um, it was... Um, up and down, as you say, there was just there were shades of ITV Arsenal that we were all hoping <laughs> not to see. <laughs> that's that's the that's the main take home, isn't mm. it? There's a, there's a sense that um, that is a draw that really should have been a win for the home team. Ooh. And I think looking back at the first goal, I mean, I think David Raya is responsible for that situation happening. Mm. But there's a lot of stuff that has to happen between him being out of position and uh -huh. Serge Gnabry putting the ball in the net. And, and obviously, this is what Mikel Arteta was talking about in the post-match when he talks about tiny, tiny margins mm. are where you get punished. And they had, a, I mean, they had a chance from, the, from deep, like deep into the right wing couple of passes and they score like th those are the sort of margins he's mm. talking about and there was a lot to do for Bayern to to, to score that goal it f in the stadium it felt like oh that is a rick that is an absolute gift but watching it back it's like oh no they still they still had a lot to do but there is the quality there at this stage in the Champions League now before the game my thoughts were that we would have to win this game to get through the tie and I am not sure I've changed my mind on that. I think it's going to be a really, mm. really tough ask going to Bayern now. Like people talk about their home form being shaky in the league. I don't know that that's going to matter too much. It's really, really difficult. But they're really impressive getting back into it. Really, really impressive getting back into it. And obviously, we'll come on to the penalty incident at the end and the sort of penalty incident that for Bayern that no one was aware it even was happened in one, the stadium. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, with, with the way the game panned out, if you're going to shoot yourselves in the foot a couple of times, getting back into it is impressive. And at least, the, the, you know, the tie is still there to, to be won, really. You, yeah, you mean, you say it wasn't really um, a David Raya mistake and all the rest of it. I, I, would, like well, I, would, hear, I would say it was I would mistake. like to hear um, from um, uh, Aaron Ramsdale's father on that but, uh, <laughs> but but Vish I mean you know Arsenal opened the scoring early on with, with Bukasak it looked pretty good and as Jim said with his ITV reference we remember how many times Bayern put Arsenal out of this competition still very much alive and Arsenal very much um, went toe to toe with Bayern on another night could have won the game yeah was anyone else not you know mildly unimpressed with, with Bayern Munich in part because of how Arsenal made them play but I thought they were really tentative. I thought every time the game kicked up a gear, they were quite shaky. Um, the most impre impressive points were basically when Arsenal let them in, in a way. So the first goal, Sané's through ball. Mm. That's that's the kind of, I'd love to be that weight full stop. Like, that's like the, <laughs> uh, that is the ideal weight of anything. Like a gorgeous pass. And they did have a bit more to do, but Arsenal kind of let them, mm -hmm. let them through, essentially. That was the amount of territory and, you know, the let's call it an overload of players, that Bayern were never going to get mm -hmm. unless Arsenal let them, unless Arsenal messed up. And, you know, they did. And even the winner, it was like, sorry, the, the winner, the, the Bayern's second goal, the penalty, there's a little bit of fortune there. You know, well, I think he dances through. But Jorginho gets the touch then takes it past two players yeah. as uh, Sané um, dances through and a bit clumsy from Saliba. And I just felt like, you know, then Bayern lost the thread of the game. And you don't really see Bayern teams do that. You know, you're kind of waiting for them to like manage it out and, you know, rip them to shreds on the break. Well, you don't normally see Thomas to. Tuchel less Bayern teams do that. That's, yeah. Well, I, th I well, think so, that's the point, really, yeah, isn't it? So this was yeah. the point I was going to make. Taking off Sane when he did, bringing, off Com bringing on Coman as a kind of like for like, fine. Mm -hmm. But you kind of think, like, why don't you just reinforce it on the other side as well? Mm. Why don't you just put a few, you know, get some legs in the middle? Take Lomer off and you know let someone else do that job. For just a bit. Delighted to see Sane go off. Yeah, he was having a brilliant game. Mm. But yeah. I think one of the biggest criticisms of as of him is he's not been good enough off the ball. So if you're going into the back end of the game, mm. I see exactly why they've removed him from that game. I I, I think it, it's it's really interesting. I think this game was kind of where Arsenal's season is in microcosm at the moment because they can still win the tie. 
They could still win the Champions League. I feel quite in- unconvinced that they will. Yeah. And like they're, they're in a position where they could like win all the big stuff. They've definitely got the ability to do it, just like they've definitely got the ability. They had mm-hmm. the ability to win it last night. Mm-hmm. They've got the ability to go to Munich and win the second leg. That, that to me, would not be a shock mm-hmm. at all. Really, if, if Arsenal are guilty of anything, is of inexperience again in the Champions League. And yeah. I think we can forget how far they've come mm-hmm. in a really short time. Mm-hmm. I I thought they played buying the name rather than buying the game for, for, for quite point. a big bit of this in the middle. Because this is... It's not a terrible Bayern side by any stretch of no. the imagination. They've still got an enormous amount of talent. And Tuchel has won the Champions League and he's, he's reached two finals yeah, fairly recently. That, that, that's right. And it, I, I, mm. I think he could potentially do it again, even yeah. if they are in the harder half Just of the Just to give him the, the, a bigger credit and balance. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I, th- I think he deserves that, absolutely. Um, but I, th- I think you look at where they are at the moment. I think the, 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 the biggest plus for, for Bayern is that I felt actually that the game was played on their terms mm. a little bit more because this Bayern are chaotic. Mm-hmm. Like, like you cannot tell what is going to happen next. There are shambles at the back. They're, they're not good enough without the ball and I include the front players in that. And that is a massive problem if, if you're going to have genuine aspirations of winning the Champions League. But the mistakes Arsenal made have not finished them. I think that's the important thing because I think there are so many times in which I regret the loss of the away goal, but this was the opposite because I think I when, the exact when, when they go, Arsenal. exactly. When mm. they go two, one down in the first half, mm. if this had happened three years ago, you'd be like, oh, they're yeah. fucked, mm. but, but they're not. And they made the most of that to engineer themselves mm. a way back into the game. Uh, yeah. You, the, the words you mentioned there when Arsenal was inexperienced and that's, I think Arsenal are a better side than Bayern. Oh, definitely. And I definitely. think that they've, they've it's, it's well within their grasp to go and win this. I think this needs a statement win mm. to go and do it. Yeah. And, and and the inexperience I cut last season, you know, Arsenal great and they 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 lost to Sporting. You know, they just get through against Paul. So mind you, if you're going to win a competition, you, you know, you might have to to win like that. So again, it's not a it's not a criticism, but it's just you're analysing what you've seen and 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 what you think and feel. And I. I yeah, let's see. Because obviously there's a whole Premier League title thing that that's that they're in sort of slightly uncharted territory, this Arsenal side at the moment, mm-hmm. with latter stages Champions <clears throat> League um, very much in the title. Obviously they were last season, but, but they were in the Europa. So what do you think of that kind of idea of the, the inexperience? Oh, it's, it's been the sort of the dominant... Um kind of theme of, of the Champions League for me this season because obviously we know Arsenal are a very good team it's, it's, it's easy to see but um, there have been times where you can see that, they're, that they've are that they not been in this competition for a long time very few of these players have even played in it you, obviously Kai Havertz and Georgie have won it but like very few players have even played in it before like, I think they need to remind people that yeah, by the yeah, way yeah Kai Havertz needs to go, but look, lads, look I've at, done this. Yeah, I've yeah. scored the winner. <laughs> Just get me there <laughs> and I'll deflect another one in. But yeah, I think so. <laughs> a, a, a great example is um, the game against Porto, the away game. They, 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 it was a completely different yeah. um, looking team. They, they, it was like they, they didn't know where they were or what they mm. were doing. It's like they hadn't sort of met each other before almost. Like the yeah. game plan was completely seemed to go out the window. They shrank a little bit. A, a silly, silly moment gave away a late goal. In the first away game of the campaign Absolutely, in yeah. France. And you know, the, the, the away ties are really, really different different in the Champions League which is what we've seen in, in mm. particular and the atmosphere there is something that they won't have experienced before uh, Bayern will be as up for it as, as the in, the full stadium of Arsenal fans uh, was that's a, mm. another thing that I'm sure we'll come back to no away fans was very very strange thing to experience mm. um, but yeah this is the learning curve is, is very very steep um, and I think maybe Jacob Kivio actually mm. uh, embodied that inexperience. Yeah, he had yeah. a really tough time against Sané and he had it, he, he got skinned a couple of times against City but sort of got away with it and I think with Tommy Asu fully fit he'd have probably started there because he's the I would say the best one-on-one defender fullback wise that Arsenal have I'm surprised he didn't start because he has mm. had minutes I'm thinking there must be a reason for that but um yeah, yeah I mean there's there's you know Saliba it's, it's uncharacteristic for yes, him to exactly. give away a penalty like that it's these these little moments as Arteta said are where you get punished and and inexperience is, is what brings them along and speaking of fullbacks you know Ben White a glorious chance to make yeah it yeah it's just not the player you want there is it the, mm. the, the, the old you want someone who cares <laughs> <laughs> that's what you want well, you want talk, someone, someone who wants to play the I game thought, I thought he had a really good game <laughs> he had a brilliant he game did, that did, tackle on Sané yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. but even his like weight of um, pass as well was, was very good gentlemen we've taken a while to get here but we're going to have to talk about the two um, 
decisions that resulted in 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 penalties not being given for either side. Yeah, I was going to say, talking of one on ones, <laughs> if we're talking about experience and making the right decision, <laughs> should Saka have just stayed up? Well, yeah. so so, so Vish, you mm. seem you and Luke on the on the round of WhatsApp seem to think it was a brilliant decision by the referee. Okay, and so VAR let not, me not, let me not to give the penalty. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'll, so I'll take over from here before you put other words in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I won't use those words. So you used... so the. Uh, the reason I thought thought it was a good decision live was the fact that all you know, all forward players, all players in the box, um, when they enter into that situation, they basically try and gain some form of contact with whoever's tackling. And them. let's be honest, I thought it probably was a penalty, but Harvey Elliott, how Harvey Elliott did that with Aaron Wambasaka. He did, and so I was almost I was kinda of looking and I know there's no before anyone like Tweets in, fuck's sake. Um, I know there are no like rule, rules tweet him. or anything set in stone <laughs> about this, but the Knive, way I look knives out, lads. <laughs> but the way I the way I kind of perceive this in my own head is that there's there's kind of an understanding that you kind of go in looking for contact, and then the threshold I feel is how far you reach for contact. I agree with you. I totally agree with and you. And so there was a moment with like live. I was like. Oh, that is a definite pen. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and then yeah. when I watch the replay, Saka basically changes where he's running yeah. in order to, you know, basically hang out his right leg to get contact. And then, at the, but at the same time, Neuer does step, mm. and so you're kind of like, right, okay, may, you know, is, does that count within my threshold? And I didn't really think so. And then I watched it again, and I was like, it's just it's a tough one to just to pull. just take yeah. just take the authentic line and put it in. See, I, yeah. I think when you watch it in real time, though, that happens so quickly. I'm not sure he actually can do that, regardless of where his but leg he is. Moves, and, he moves and Neuer, all the time, Neuer though, blocks him off as well. well I think I, it's a block from Neuer. I, it could be. I, to be honest, no, I with think you, he spreads himself. Well, I think, but, but I don't. I don't think he actually makes the move. But with Saka, though, I think that he's going so quickly, and his footballing brain and muscle memory kicks in. I, I he may well have not consciously thought. You know what? I'm gonna. I'm going to play for a penalty. He might so so for him having a, a shout to give him the benefit of the doubt. He might actually being think extremely kind to him there to, an Engli- like, to a fellow Englishman, Andy. <laughs> yes, I look, will. I, I love I love Bukayo Saka, uh. but as you know, I'm I'm not massively hung up on on on, on people taking dives or manufacturing fouls. And he is a serial. Do you say that when you're on the continent. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's no need. There's no need. No there. need. <laughs> but I, he's he's a serial manufacturer of mm. of. Of, of getting I, contact I, I, and I, that, that's that's fine I'm not saying it's the defining feature of his game mm. but he, he does it all the time and there well, he, he would have so. been, been better staying up yeah okay well whatever view you take it, it's an incredibly difficult one to call I think and and, and I think if it's gone either way people yeah. would go I, I tend to agree with, with Vish actually I think it was just the leg was, was just at that angle to suggest that he's, he's left it in there but the other decision yeah, it, yeah or for, non-decision for, well non-decision yes exactly was when Bayern felt very strongly, and Thomas Tuchel certainly felt that, he said it in the post-match a few times afterwards, uh, that they should have had a penalty for what would have been an unbelievable mistake from from um, Gabriel. Uh, from Gabriel, because obviously, and some people may have watched the game and not picked up on this, because Jim, you said in the stadium, it seemed to be unaware. When I watched back, I watched the game, but when I watched back the highlights as well, um, it wasn't in the highlights package. And this is when David Raya clearly takes the goal kick to Gabriel and Gabriel picks it up with his hands as if to say, no, let's do that again. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well they, they do that quite a Which lot. Which famously sort of... you can't do in football. No, indeed, <laughs> I just want to yeah. take that penalty again. You know, like... <laughs> yeah, but it's, I mean, you would think presumably Gabriel's not heard the whistle, but by the I mean, letter of the law. It, why is even watching it back? Like, the the whistle's so clear. Well, the thing is, Jim, that it makes no sense from, from what Gabriel's doing. And maybe this is Arsenal in the Champions League. I don't know. Yeah. Although they are in the quarterfinals, to be fair to them. But like, there's nobody putting pressure on the players. So yeah. even if he wants to take the goal kick again or whatever, yeah, well, that's just what put I've... your foot on the ball and do or what. There's no need to pick the bloody thing yeah. up. And and surely as a defender, you should be conditioned. Well, no, but if you put your ball, if you put your foot on the ball, then you you're essentially putting it into play, aren't you? That's why. But then he, yes. he, he, he saying that he puts it down and kicks it to him anyway. So well, it's... I mean, this to me is like you know when you make a pass back, don't do it between the sticks. You know, like if you're a defender, don't just casually pick up the ball when it all seems a bit strange. Just hit it long. Yeah, get but, up there. But, that, but that's part of you'd assume that was part of being a footballer. Like sometimes when you play Sunday League, if oh. you're in a situation where someone, for example, um, 
someone else is running up to you to take the throw. You've got the ball. Yeah. You don't throw the ball to them as a throw over the head. <laughs> be like, right, let's, you know, let's, there's mm. under no illusions here that mm. you're going to take the throw. Yeah. So I'm just going to drop it down or I'm going to underarm definitely, it to you. Whatever. Definitely. Or in a free kick, you know, oh. I'll take a free kick. I'll move it. You don't pass them the ball, do you? <laughs> exactly. It's just a complete, uh, yeah. I, I, it's like a, it was a glitch. It was, it was a glitch. It was straight. But the Bayern yeah. players were very clear. They wanted a penalty. But the, refer- the, re- the referee's explanation is, is the star here. Well, the referee it? basically said, oh, he said to Tuchel, I wasn't going to give that because you know it was it was a child's mistake or something. Kids so the, mistake. Kids yeah. mistake. Yeah, um, they're very similar child children and kids. But um, twenty six years old. <laughs> but I mean, but it's, it's, it's weird because he's not. Wrong, Sorry, officer, it's a kid's mistake. <laughs> yeah, you've had I your thought, one. you've had your one. I thought it was a guideline. If I was if, if I was Manuel, limit. if I was Manuel Neuer, I would have you know, or one of the defenders. Well, we've had that's our one. Yeah. Thing, you know, like, uh, it's it's insane. Yeah, he, because he basically says to Thomas Tuchel, "Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it was a handball, but I let them away with it." Yeah. That is what he said. However, as our, as angry as Bayern were, understandably, is there an argument to say? That we want common sense to prevail. There was, it didn't change anything in the game. There was no players broken down. Is there an argument to say it's actually really good refereeing? I understand what he means, what the referee means, right? Because of exactly what you've said there. Mm. What's, your, what's your Twitter handle again? It's uh, <laughs> you're going to get Marcus Speller. <laughs> um, That's my X handle. Um, <laughs> anyway, carry on. Sorry, but yeah, like I, I do kind of understand what he means, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> it, because what it, what he also said in his quote was that he felt that it, it was a so it's a kid's mistake mm. in that environment of a you know a Champions League game oh. knockout game yeah. where he just felt no this is a bit ridiculous yeah. but that's also why it, it should have been it's, given it's 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 yeah stunning it's a, I'm very grateful to the referee's discretion there if that was Clement Turpin or like Mike Dean yep. they'd have cartwheeled over to that spot. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just, just oh, that but, yellow for good measure. Yeah. Also, he is so even though like Thomas Tuchel is um, a very intense character, yeah. but clearly on his way out, so maybe subdued in some way. Imagine if that was Pep or, or Klopp, I, I, I won't. or Jose. Yeah, but I think with any of them, it's one of those things where it's like it's so weird that you probably like want to appeal for it fifteen minutes later. Yeah, you, know, you, you sort of look at it and you think, Hang on. did that really happen? Yeah. But I mean, I mean, do you think that there is? That does even does any percentage of you think actually that's kind of common sense prevail and it's good reference, or do you think that is just outrageous and one hundred percent? I think it can be both. Right? Yeah, I yeah. think it can be. Both. Andy, in this day and age, you've got to choose one or the other, <laughs> and you've got to be one hundred percent on one thing or the other. And you've got to write it in capitals. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. right. An exclamation marks all over it. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it, it's extraordinary uh, moment of the game. There's, there's no two ways about that. Yeah. Before we move on, can I just talk about how strange it was for the, to be at a game with no away fans? I know I, this is quite a common thing I'd in, love in to hear Spain this, yeah. and some countries. It was obviously or the old firm derby. <laughs> yeah, well, it was similar to that because when Bayern scored, obviously there was there was nothing. Was it nice to see Harry all. Kane back at the end? No, um, <laughs> it wasn't. It was annoying. Um, <laughs> like the, the strange thing about it is, obviously at the beginning of the game in particular, it was really really loud, and mm. it felt like you could feel the extra volume almost. And seeing that part of the stadium celebrate when yeah. Saka scored in the first half was was unusual as well. Um, but, Finally, they're seeing it from our <laughs> angle. Yeah. <laughs> but the the strange thing is, is that a huge huge part of the culture of English football is the back and forth between between fans and obviously mm. that's true in European football as well and it was really really strange to yeah. not have that yeah. now the, 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 the volume levels were pretty great throughout it but there were a few moments where it sort of it died down a bit as it does in any stadium and generally when those silences happen you get a song from, from the away fans that you mm. hear and then mm. the home fans respond to that and this like, is a library is don't restored. respond lads that sort of stuff yeah that's at the cottage um, though but um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was it was a really interesting experience. So if we go back to Unai Emery's last game in charge of Arsenal, where Arsenal played Eintracht Frankfurt, and Eintracht I was there with Jim we there, yeah. mm. famously yeah, bought their bad. way into hospitality and so you didn't know they were in there until they started cheering when Eintracht Frankfurt scored. Are we basically just saying Eintracht Frankfurt fans are more enterprising than Bayern fans? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the only conclusion we can take. From <laughs> yeah. I thought it'd be I thought it'd be fucking brilliant if uh, Bayern had won the toss and and flipped them. That would have been good. Uh, yeah, We're yeah, going to yeah. kick to... Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, it could have been. It could have happened. Well, it's nicely poised uh, for the second leg, as is uh, Real Madrid and Manchester City. They drew three all at the Bernabeu, in case anybody missed it. Six goals, four of which were scored outside the box. Um, but Valverde's goal, you know, 
what a goal it was uh, that volley. So that was inside the box, technically. They're just an unbelievable array of good goals. Yeah. And yeah, it, I mean, didn't... it justified its decision for it to be my big telly game and the Arsenal game to be on the iPad. But really, they, birth, they both deserve to be on the big telly. Yeah. I Basically, I need to buy a second big telly. Yeah. Andy, Andy there, yeah. was, there would have been a lot of people watching these games who would have gone, they would have been watching one game and something happens in the other, oh, better change. And they'd have gone back and forth, back and forth, yeah. and not actually ended up watching. Yeah, you, you miss it. all of the goals if you do that. Exactly. But you didn't have to wait long for one in this game. Bernardo Silva with a beauty. Oh. With a beauty. I said um, on the WhatsApp group, Gary McAllister would have been proud of that yeah. one, Jim. I, I don't think my foot has the bit that he used for that <laughs> shot. How'd you even do that? Yeah, I, I think you're just born with it. Yeah. Or you develop it in a lab or something. I don't know. So, so, what, such a smart finish. So, mm. so, such quick thinking. And it is nights like this, when it gets to this stage, I just love the Champions League. I know what you mean. I know there's a lot of criticism of it and there's, you know, there's a lot, a lot of problems with it and, 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 and that we won't go into now. Um, but the quality is so consistently high. And this is another example of that. Three all at the Bernabeu. Yeah. I mean, and it's not surprising, is it? It's not surprising mm. for, for the first leg of a Champions League quarterfinal to mm. be this high in quality. Yeah. And again, with, with two sides, packed full of quality as well. I mean, much was made of sort of Foden versus Bellingham and all that kind of stuff. Of course, in the summer, they'll be very much on the same team. Stop that was it. a bit of a damn squib, actually, uh, wasn't it? A little bit. Awful to watch. Awful to watch. Every time they got near each other, I was like, leave each other alone. <laughs> <laughs> Just, now, you know, remember remember the bigger picture here. Yes, yeah? exactly, yeah. Um, we're going to jump ahead to the Foden goal, which, which I would like to. Um, now, I've said that Foden should play on the left wing for England. I am aware, though, when I keep seeing Foden scoring these goals, when he's sort of coming in from a more sort of like right central position and, and, and rifling the ball in, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. So, like... Mm, yeah, but uh, you, know, you, know, you know what? That's, that's only one way of looking at it, isn't it? Because Foden has had... If it's the goal way of looking at it. <laughs> Foden, Andy, Foden, such a great strike. Foden has, has had an amazing season. Yeah. A season where... I mean, I think it's probably between him and Declan Rice for player of the, the, the year. I mean, the and two Foden are is having the run at the moment, which will probably win him the, well, it's the award. It's fresher in the memory, more spectacular yes, moments. Ex- that kind of exactly, thing. exactly. And I think the voting's done, you know, concludes quite soon, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. The voting done it like the first week of Feb or something yeah. stupid like that. But <laughs> I, Cobby I, I think <laughs> this, 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 ga- this game kind of underlined hmm. how incredibly valuable Foden is yeah. uh, and what a talent he is but at the same time that City are entering a little bit of a transition period uh, maybe a mini transition period mm. why, why do you think well that? because you, well it goes back to what you were saying about Foden playing on the left actually mm. I'm sure you, if you say you want him on the left I'm sure Erling Haaland would agree with you <laughs> particularly after that because he's like right where are all these balls that it's really easy for me to tap in when yeah. I have like 15 mm. touches a game yeah. Whereas, he did look furious there, when there, that there one is, went in <laughs> there, is, there are so many great things about Foden uh-huh. but in the central position yeah. he has not quite worked out how to consistently supply Haaland yet I, gr- I, I agree I, with that I, point, I, yeah. I think that's a bit of a problem for them Whereas Bellingham... because, because the thing is like Foden will in many ways mm-hmm. go on in, unless there's a huge injury or anything like that, to be, I, I think, a more thrilling player mm-hmm. than Kevin De Bruyne. Will he ever become a better supplier of Erling Haaland than Kevin De Bruyne? Probably not. Mm. And really, what we're seeing now is probably a little bit of a changeover. I suspect, and I said this right at the start of the season, that this would be a changeover season. Probably De Bruyne will go at the end of the season, I, I, w- I would suspect. Mm. And, and Foden has that spot locked down. But that means that they've got to continue working out how to get the best out of Erling Holland. Because in a game like this, mm. in which there are loads of chances, in which City were good but not amazing, mm. what would have won them this game is Holland getting a couple of great chances. But in fact, you had loads of people going, well, he, he didn't do anything. Mm. Whereas, actually, I think that's kind of the plan with City. Well, yeah. you, do, you don't want Haaland to have, like, 50 touches a game. There are so many other players who exactly, you would rather yeah. have the ball yeah. in that team than him. You just want him to be on the end of chances. But there weren't the quality of chances for him to be the end of, which would have won City this game. It's a, it's a very good point. And, I mean, the three goals they scored, you know, we talked about Silver's one there, of course. Great free kick, 
um, Foden's was a and it made the keeper look look a bit daft as well. Did, did, uh, you've got to get points for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And 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 Guardiola's goal again, another yeah. another a great and one from Gre- outside the box. Grealish's work for Guardiola was was excellent yeah. as well. Well, it's it good to see really, Grealish really well putting in performances, definitely. putting in shifts, and and great to see him start the Bernabeu. I'm, yeah. I'm convinced he'll go to the Euros, of course. Agreed. Um, and Agreed. and and he he just looked sprightly mm. again. Mm. You know, you got that spring in his step. Well, he wants it, doesn't he? I think a lot of the you know, especially after they won the treble, and we focus a lot on uh, on his hidings afterwards. You always kind of forget with with Grealish just how much he wants. He yeah. wants those big moments, yeah. but when those big moments come, he puts a proper shift in. Well, he does. Yeah. I think that's often overlooked with with Grealish. Yeah. We loved him as that sort of maverick at Aston Villa, where he would put a shift in, but he was free roll if you can. He get, he'd basically get more of the ball than that. He would satisfy himself. Yeah, that totally. Way. But yeah, that, yeah. you know, but that's that's you know, that's it's way in the past now. But in, unless you have him and Bernardo Silva working the bollocks off on the flanks, mm. th- th- there's no way that yeah. City win the Champions League Totally, and, and I think that the, the Grealish is industry, which uh, you, you might argue that he, he learned at Manchester City or honed whatever word you want to use. You know, he was out the team for that that first season. Yeah. You know, a bit part, and he, he learned it. And I think that sometimes, you know, we love Grealish off the field and, and what a character he is and, and personality. But on the pitch, you know, he has that footballing brain that Guardiola demands of his players. He wouldn't start, like, look at last season, they won the treble, he started loads of games. Mm. He wouldn't do that if Guardiola's not seeing something in him because, we, as we know, Guardiola doesn't give a damn about the price tag or, or who you are. If you're not putting it in or you're not getting it, then you're not going to be playing. So it's really good to see him, um, personally, I think. Um, uh, but, uh, but as you said, Kevin De Bruyne didn't feature for, for Man City. Pep said it was because he was vomiting before the game, mm. which is an interesting one. Now That was an awkward interview, even by Pep's standards. Yeah. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing, though. It was for anyone that hasn't seen it. It's, yeah. uh, he's asked why um, Kevin De Bruyne isn't starting. And he, with a weird grin, he just looks at the interviewer and goes, vomit. <laughs> which is like, what? Yeah. Vomit. <laughs> And then he sort of explains, obviously, that De Bruyne has been ill, and he's it, mm. going to be up there in the pantheon of Pep. Yeah, uh, strange interview. Was he trying to feed him <laughs> like a bird? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> yeah, I think I think even feeding like football tactics like that. Open your mouth. <laughs> yeah, here's a heat, he's a heat heat map. You know, <laughs> can we we um we we kind of like we we t- touched on the phone and goal. Yeah. Um, does anyone else think there's something really funny about his technique when he hits those bangers? It, I know what you mean. It looks like the, he, those almost, little legs shouldn't have that power. No, no, no. With, okay. his, with his head, he kind of cocks his head one way as if he's going for a no-look shot. Okay. And I think he's doing it in the way that so cricketers often do this when they try and hit the ball in the air mm-hmm. because they lose because you can lose shape trying to hit the ball as hard as possible and your head is the heaviest part of your body. To maintain their balance, they keep looking down. So even after they've hit the ball, they're not looking at where it's going. I just thought they were. So that as they follow safe. through... Ah. And okay. I wondered that with Foden because oh. he scored a couple of goals where it, like, it looks like his head's really cocked and he's clearly focusing on keeping it dead still. Okay. And it looks absurd. He's got excellent posture. So if there's anyone who's going to have that sort of head control, That's probably a good shout. is. He does Phil have excellent Foden. posture, yeah. Yeah, maybe they. Um, <clears throat> maybe but these are the kind of margins, though. Like they'll teach yeah. players that, you know. Although at the same time, Guardiola only gets that chance because his first touch was abysmal. He's <laughs> yeah. chasing after it. Oh, he fooled you as well, did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, and and you know, obviously, um, there, there were other goals in the game, but Valverde's was was up there as well. It needed something special, a crisp volley, um, to uh, to make it through or just. I mean, Guardiola said on the second leg, we take the result in one week in Manchester, it will be sold out. Our people will help us to score uh, one goal and we will do the rest to try and reach the semi-final. It will be sold out. It's a weird little detail, Sud- well, isn't it? Well, they, well, he's constantly... Taylor had, Swift over here. But he's, <laughs> he's constantly, he's con- constantly brought that up, hasn't he? Well, he has, Particularly so, on Champions League nights. And suddenly I think he, he realises, yeah, we could really do with them. Mm. But I mean, if you remember the atmosphere when they put in quite possibly the best performance I've ever seen a football team Put in when they hammered Real yeah. Madrid. Was it four yeah. 0 Yeah, yeah. Honestly, like, I think, like, honest, possibly the best performance I've ever seen. It's it's the best performance I've ever seen in the flesh. So yeah, but even on TV, Andy, I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, it was so so stunning, and I think sometimes like they won the Champions League that night. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Despite their best efforts in Istanbul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, I just got all starry-eyed over that performance. It was amazing. But it's, you know, but the atmosphere and everything, you know, you'll go into that. Um, they'll 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 be looking for something like that. But I mean, again, Manchester City on their day, 
are still the best team in Europe for, mm. for a lot of people's money, mine, mine included. I, mean, I, I think that's that's the thing, though, isn't it? You, you feel that, you know, you said how Arsenal would need to produce a signature performance yes. to go and win at Bayern, for example, which I would not disagree with. I think we know that if City play at their best for half an hour in the second leg, they'll win. Yeah, yeah. they're absolutely in the driving seat now. I think the same is true of Bayern, but I would say more with... More with City. Agree. Because they've got yeah. that experience now. Yeah. They've yeah. got the fear factor yeah. as well. I mean, Rodrigo was talking before the game about how they wanted to avoid City. And they've got that aura <laughs> yeah. that Real Madrid themselves used to have. Indeed they do. All right, coming up in the second half, everybody, we've got the Everton points uh, deduction. Uh, Ruben Amorim being linked to Liverpool and Cristiano Ronaldo's Benedict. See you in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> just helps it past him oh there's no touch it's a diving treat Bamford Bamford, Bamford the cheat will take the free <laughs> kick Welcome back to the Football Ramble, everybody. Was that Josh Winnicom? <laughs> it was the QPR commentator on uh, Patrick Bamford the cheat Deary me. Um, yeah, so before we get into the, the real kind of uh, important stuff uh, let's go to Saudi Arabia uh, Cristiano Ronaldo has been in the headlines uh, once again, for the wrong reasons. I mean, he was doing that sort of penis pulling um, gesture not that long ago. Um, uh, and now he's been sent off for violent conduct. This was in the Saudi Super Cup. He's, he's amassed quite a few red cards yeah. in his career. Do you know how many? I do. Does anybody do you want to have if, those who don't know the number? I would say I'm, I'm going to go eight. eight. I was going to go 12. 12. 12 would be right. 12 red cards. Is that right? Isn't that incredible? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he's, you know, he's been playing for years. <laughs> yeah, and he's got more of a bell end with each year, so they're going to accumulate. How many they? red cards has Lionel Messi got? <laughs> not twelve. <laughs> hey, you're winning on that stat, exactly, Ronaldo. Yeah. <laughs> Do you not care? Do you not care, Lionel? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Are we counting his stats in Saudi Arabia? Do we want to disrespect the whole thing that much? I don't know. Um, so yes, he was sent off for violent conduct, and then, and then in a sort of a, a gesture where where he he almost sort of looked to like punch the ball at the referee as if to suggest. This is my league, mate. Yeah, I'm I can able... do what I like. Yeah, it, it, basically that yeah. was it, wasn't it, Jim? Um... They've literally re- rewritten laws for me here. <laughs> <laughs> but as he left the pitch, the crowd are chanting, Messi, Obviously. Messi. Yeah. And it's so funny because... He can't this get away is, from it. But, it's, but it only exists for him. Yeah. No one's doing that in America. No. And it's the only place in which this rivalry still exists and it gets to him so much. No, that chant would eat anywhere he goes. If you just want to wind no, but up. How, what I mean is that the, the chant is the only place in which the rivalry oh, is now in any sort of play. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. He's, he's just going to, like, if he wants to get away from that chant, he is going to have to move back to an ivory tower in Madeira. Yeah. You know but I mean? like, but he, thought, only... he thought this was his ivory tower. Yeah, he that's did. the point. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they did give him a lot of ivory towers to go <laughs> there. I mean, when, yeah. he was, when he was waving his fist mm. at the referee, he really reminded me of uh, Nathan Barley after a setback. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely reference, that. Uh, yeah. Maybe not um, everyone will get it, but still. Um, I free, thought, free to watch online. I thought Treat you were going to say yeah. something like Ben Thatcher or somebody angry like that. <laughs> yeah, people get Ben Thatcher. Ben Thatcher. Yeah. 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 Definitely. At least he played in the Premier League yeah. and he's a real person. Um, <laughs> but there we are. Uh, reference for, 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 you know, choose which one you prefer. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, there we are. Poor old Ronaldo, eh? Poor old Ronaldo. I really yeah. hope he can't catch a break. Can can't it? catch a break. Is Mitrovic, he certainly was up there in the scoring records or, or, or the scoring tally with him. Let's hope, uh... <laughs> Mitrovic up there shouting, Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Welcome back at the cottage anytime. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, come back to England uh, and uh, specifically to Liverpool, where Everton have been given a two point deduction for breaching Premier League's profit and sustainability rules for the three year period ending in 2023 another points deduction so soon after the last one of course they were given six point deduction for breaching the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules for the three year period ending in 2022 so um, you know six point deduction for the one ending in 2022 two point deduction in 2023 uh, they're learning their lessons Jim yeah, in a new feature of the show where Everton get deducted points every single week. Um, it, it certainly appears that way. I mean, the good thing for Everton, I suppose, is this is still less than the 10-point deduction they yes. initially got. So I suppose they would have, they would have to a point, made their peace with that, would be mm. preparing to tr- sort of make that up. Yes, well, the Premier League originally recommended a five-point deduction for this, but an independent commission recommended reducing that to two points due to uh, losses in years that overlap with their previous punishment and the club's early admission of guilt. Now, obviously, this but is something... 
it always benefits you, to be honest, Andy. Absolutely. Now, Eventually. I mean, obviously. It will catch up with you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, this is something that's very upsetting for Everton fans, mm. and I, I, I don't think we can overlook that. But outside Everton fans, I feel this has only really become more of a discussion in probably the last four to six weeks. Because until this recent run that obviously they ended by beating Burnley at the weekend, we talked about it, didn't we? About this is probably the best season to lose 10 points. Yeah. Or, or then yeah, after that, definitely. six yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they never look like getting relegated. They look too good to get relegated, even with the points mm. deduction. Mm. And it's that poor run of form that's brought them back into the mix and made it more sort of germane as a discussion. Yeah, I mean, they're two points above relegation now. And mm. they've been docked eight points in total. I mean, that, 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 that shows you, doesn't it? Um, although, you know, the teams around them will be... Um, still kind of uh, very focused. I mean, Andros Townsend said Luton are using a version of the Premier League table without deductions. Well, they have to because they're appealing, yeah. because yeah. Forrest are yeah. appealing. Although I did think to myself, that could, you know, really, really discourage everybody because you know, that would put Luton... But I get the point he's saying. But I mean, you know, he also said, you know, from a player's point of view, and there he's playing for a side of course in Luton who are, who are down there with him, he said, this is kind of makes a mockery of the Premier League, all this kind of stuff happening during the season and, and so on and so forth. But I mean, I, I, I just... What's the alternative? Though? Well, exactly. And the I, alternative is don't break the rules you agree to. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but you're right, though. I think that... But in the, terms of dealing with it. Yeah, no, exactly. I think there's a, there's a lot of strong opinions um, coming from, you know, a particular angle. But as you say, what what is the alternative? I mean, you know, it, it's a funny one. I mean, the Premier League, they obviously set a backstop date of the 24th of, of May for both of um, Forrest and Everton's appeals to be concluded, which is which is five days after the end of the season. So it's unprecedented. I would have thought that maybe the Premier League would have been a little bit tighter and a bit clear on this, considering the way football's kind of gone in the last, I suppose, 10, 15 years. Um, but I, 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 you know, sometimes lost for words when, mm. when you know, looking at this situation. Another thing I think Everton will rightly be aggrieved by is there's a lot of talk now that the rules are going to change in the summer anyway. Well, indeed, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think anybody will be happy with this. No. If Everton do survive, which you know, I, th- I think they would, you know, the sides will be, you know, could be pissed off and say, well, hang on a minute, actually, well, what if it was a five-point deduction? You know, that was recommended by the league we're playing in. Yeah. And, th- and that would have kept us up and then and then going down. So do you, we have people who are unhappy, you know, because it's all very well now where the, you're still in the Premier League and you're still fighting. Bang, if, you, if, if, if Luton are relegated on the final day and Everton survived by a point, you know, you're damn right they're going to be pissed off. But then, of course, Everton are going to be pissed off. You know, mm. points. It, no one will be happy and with it. And it. it was avoidable, you know, because if, if you're going to set, set in place a system that has punishments, mm. you need to decide the parameters of those punishments before you dish them out. It's mad yeah. to go, all right, you're punished. Um, we'll figure out what the punishment actually is later. Mm. It should have been set in stone. It's very, very avoidable. Mm. Now, I mean, there's been this discussion of replacing the current system with a sort of luxury tax sort of business like they have in the NBA for example mm. who do you think that's going to benefit Andy <laughs> <laughs> well that, that's that's the real question isn't it I mean, it's a, I mean at least they've signposted it. it's even called luxury yeah. tax can you give a quick sort of price if you're it? Newcastle you're, 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 you're rubbing your hands aren't you? <laughs> yeah. like, so in the NBA for example I mean this is different obviously because it relates to salaries rather than mm-hmm. spending on transfer fees yes. or which, whatever which you don't have um, so you have a soft cap and then you have a hard cap and well, there are a lot of teams in the Premier League that will be hard capped at the mm, moment mm. because there's a, a, a hard cap that you really can't go above. When you when you got to that, is, yeah, yeah, when you got to that point um, where you've like basically mortgaged your future and you're completely stuck, you've you've no mm. room to manoeuvre at all. And you know if you're up at the top of the hard cap, you're you, you're, you're stuck. But uh, I think it's it's clear that already that would only really benefit what two clubs, mm. yeah. It'd be very different in football, wouldn't it? So the, I think the idea of, of, as I understand it, would be that um, if you go above that soft cap, you are then fined, and the proceeds from that fine are then distributed against, like, uh, among the rest of the clubs in the league. So you pay, you pay for overpaying. Yeah, you pay for overpaying, but then you know it gets split nineteen ways. So if you are a, a city or a Newcastle and you have access to an, an enormous amount of money, that's fine, right? You, th- th- that's not really going to bother you. No. Competitors aren't going to get really any advantage. And the concern for me is that I think there's been because PSR has been implemented so badly, everyone's looking at it as like the bad guy. Basically, we need to get yeah. need to get rid of it. It's anti-competitive. It keeps the status quo as it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, 
But I think the issue with, well, the potential issue with the luxury tax is that it's the, the league essentially going, well, actually, everyone seems to want to be able to spend as much money as they want and they don't seem that worried about potentially risking their futures on sort of going in too hard. So it's what they want. Let's let them have it. Mm. I think they'll probably enjoy that because, you know, when clubs spend a lot of money, it's it's interesting, isn't it? It's mm. exciting. You think, oh, what, what's going to happen here? Well, I mean... Sort of, and like, there aren't the point of PSR, however it's been implemented, is to protect clubs from themselves essentially, yeah. and stop them doing that. And if we just kind of tear that up and go, well, off you go. Mm. I just, I think there's, there's it'll take a club, a big club going out of business. Yeah, and and, and and this will, you know, this will allow that. This, I mean, this, this this all underlines why you need an independent regulator, despite the fact that the Premier League have been pissing and moaning about it for mm. absolutely ages. Because the fact is, the current system and the system. Mm that might be in the future, as, as, as we've described, both of those just don't care less about how it affects the fans. Yeah. Th- yeah. That's, that's the problem, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Um, let's stay in, in Liverpool for, for, for a moment. Um, so uh, it is being reported by Sky Germany that Liverpool have reached a verbal agreement with sporting manager Ruben Amorim. Um, he has an exit clause in his uh, contract this summer. Uh, sources on Merseyside are denying the reports. Uh, Amarim has been linked with with Manchester United, Chelsea, Aston Villa, and, and more. He's only thirty nine years old, which which is incredible. He'd be the second youngest current Premier League manager. He, he was once th- labelled the special one two point oh. Let there have been more versions than that, haven't there? I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> the last bias. The last bias. Is it the point that there's only one? Yeah. Yeah, mm. that's true. But isn't that very football? But they. <laughs> You're the unique one, the third one we've had, but you're the unique <laughs> one, yeah. David Moyes was the chosen one, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, he has he has credited Jose Mourinho as one of his inspirations, but I think he's probably contractually, Out of politeness. Uh, contractually obliged yeah. to do that. Just for uh, an easy life. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we know how it runs in Portugal and who makes it run in Portugal. Um, but uh, when all said and done, Andy Brassel, he is a very talented and, and very, very good football manager. And... You know, at, at, at that age uh, as well, he's got the world at his, uh, at his on his tactics board. Not really at his feet anymore. The <laughs> world on his iPad. Yeah, he's got the world on his <laughs> iPad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got. I must update my references. Um, but you know, obviously, people are very, very excited about say Jabby Alonso. Rightly so. Amarim's got a little bit more experience than say Jabby Alonso. Yeah. But he's showing that kind of 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 I suppose. Uh, you know, level that kind of um, uh, ambition and, and that kind of quality that a club can have. So it's no wonder he's being courted by so many big clubs. I mean, what he's been able to achieve at, at, at Sporting is is really really impressive. Mm. So won them the league for the first time in in nineteen years. Yeah, and bear in mind that Porto or Benfica win it pretty much every year. Oh yeah, it's, they traditionally and currently have far less resources than than those teams. They have to generate their own money. A little bit like Liverpool on a smaller scale, you mm-hmm. you could argue. Um, the academy's massively important, just like Liverpool. I think it's not about choosing a good manager, capital A, capital G, capital M, to replace Jurgen Klopp. Mm-hmm. It's about finding someone who perfectly fits the philosophy, isn't it? The philosophy of the mm-hmm. club. The philosophy of the club that is going to continue after Klopp has gone. So I think... Obviously, it's going to be enormously difficult for whoever succeeds Klopp. But I think this is something that makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways. It, I mean, it is a normal. It's a huge act to follow. But it's not like we saw at Manchester United or to a lesser degree Arsenal. You know, this is a very healthy squad. I mean, I know there's one or two players like Salah who may be sort of coming towards the end. But it's well, not like Ferguson walking away from United. No, exactly. Yeah. The, the, the age know, profile of the squad indeed, is, is perfect it, for this. Yeah, indeed. It's almost as if Klopp has kind of done a lot of the transition yeah. for the next Michael match. Edwards is coming back as well to ease yep. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then like, who knows what's going to happen with Salah. I think his deal's off up at the end of next season. Mm. So, yeah, there's yeah, going to be a lot of turnover as well. They've got their new sporting director in Richard Hughes. You know, that, is it fair to say they're, that, they're, that Salah might end up in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, they, they, Saudis would be all over that, wouldn't they? Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, they definitely. tried hard last year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 so sure. Anyway, they might get a huge wedge for a minute. It might actually make sense. Well, I yeah, maybe. Anyway. The, um, one of the things I wanted to put to you, Andy, about Amarim is... Obviously, a lot is made about having to have the capacity to deal with the emotional weight of being a Liverpool manager, in part because of like not, you know, not necessarily because of that, oh, this means more to us, but more down to the fact that 
it is a bit of a fishbowl, and when it goes wrong, you're very, very aware of that. Is he the kind of person who can deal with that? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, th- I think the fact, if you look, he, he had his playing history at Benfica as as, as well as being at, at Sporting. He managed under a very combustible president in Antonio Salvador at Braga. And that's that's the amazing thing. He's been through this pressure before because when he arrived at Sporting in the first place, he'd been in charge of Braga. Now, he won a cup there, but he'd been in charge for 13 games. And Sporting, who had absolutely no money, spent £10 million on him off the back of that. Third nice. most like, expensive manager in history. Yeah. In all football, it's not Portuguese. Yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. They, they it's not took, a phrase you hear much, is it? No. But yeah. they, they took an enormous gamble. Yeah. And so for, for them to spend that money on him and him not just to meet expectation, but far surpass it. And if they go on to win the league this season, which is incredibly likely, mm. they've got a great chance of, of winning the league and cup double, by the way. I mean, they beat Benfica last weekend. To, he, lo- he loves a league cup win, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. <laughs> to, to put themselves in the, in, in the box seat, for winning the, the league by winning the Lisbon derby la- last uh, season. He's had to rebuild a team as well. Mm. Now, obviously, in Portugal, it's about constantly rebuilding. And Liverpool have always been open to selling key players and to, mm. to, to moving on, haven't they? And sometimes that can be like obviously quite emotionally but difficult. Think, yeah. But I think if you look at the way that he rebuilt the team after the centre of his midfield got ripped out and you look at like Palinha, oh. Matias Nunez, but, but players who cannot be replaced mm. if you're a Portu- Portuguese team. And he, he did brilliantly to do oh, so. Oh, Andy, you, they're gonna, Liverpool are going to sign Joao Palinha in the summer when he goes there. That's what's going to happen, isn't it? You think? Yeah, because he loves him. He, you know, he, he had him at Braga when he was there. He has him at Sporting. Ah, oh, I don't want this to happen. Oh, sorry. Give it a two. <laughs> I mean, Sporting have some really good players at the moment that they might even get a fast track to. Like Diamande, obviously, very, very highly rated. Victor Giocarez. I, I mean, I don't know if Liverpool are in the market for that sort of player, but you wonder if that might. I think. I think be it. sometimes, like, sometimes your new manager buying the players they used to manage does not do well. Idea, Doesn't always yeah. work out. Um, I, what Amarim would love, if if indeed he does become Liverpool manager, is being able to buy some big players and or, or having quality players and keeping them. I know what you mean that Liverpool, you know, but it just the fact is that, that when that sporting side was 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 just dissembled, if you like, it, it, that was always going to happen. Um, I, Maybe yeah. this is sporting's plan, though. It's like, right, the next man after Klopp is going to have a rough time. You go and do that. Spend an absolute <laughs> yeah. fortune yeah. on a couple of our players yeah. and then we'll have you back in 10 years yeah. when you've gone on somewhere else. Clever. Well, that would be, 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 be a masterstroke, Jim, you'd have to say. Uh, right, let's turn our attention to tonight's games. Paris Saint-Germain versus Barcelona. Football Club Barcelona, if we're doing full names. Um, and Atletico <laughs> Madrid versus uh, Borussia Dortmund. Um, which one immediately uh, jumps out at you, Andy Brassel? <laughs> well, this is really interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's the week half of the draw. So you think it's an enormous opportunity for one of these to get to the final, when realistically... None of the four of them should be getting to the final. I think PSG Ooh. Ooh. are in a really, really good spot to take control of this half of the draw. Um, they should do because even if they're not the best PSG side we've seen mm. in the QSI era, they are in many ways, I think, quite well equipped to to win the Champions League mm. because th- we, we talked about how good you need to be off the ball and how Bayern, for example, aren't good enough off the ball to, to to win the Champions League. PSG are much closer to that than they were last year, or in fact, in either of the, the Messi, Neymar years. They're a lot defensively stronger. I think they're better than Barcelona, and I think they will beat whoever gets through Atletico Dortmund as as, as, as well. Interesting, because I think this is, this is Atletico's chance to get back to the final. Mm. I, 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 I think they're simply not good enough to do it. Yeah. But then again, that is the joy of this half of the draw. Isn't well, it? that's also like the, the joy of Atletico Madrid, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They find a way. I think, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, th- I think Barcelona, yeah. I mean, look, let's, I mean, Luis Enrique, obviously PSG coach, former Barcelona player. I mean, he had a dig at Xavi ahead of the game saying that his team represents Barcelona's football identity more than Xavi's does, it, the, which I love that. It's really interesting because this question was Ramp put, it up. It, this question was put to him and he responded, which is a, a, a cheeky thing journalists do. It makes yes. it sound like someone just called their own press conference to go, and another thing. <laughs> um, but he was like, yeah, if you look at the titles I've won, it's just facts, etc., etc." And it's, he sounded like one of those people who tells it like it is. Yes. Mm. You know, people who never have anything good to say. Well, he's a bit of a character, Luis Enrique. Well, that's yeah. the thing. Luis Enrique is not going to answer the question that the journalist wants him to answer. He's going to no. answer whatever question 
question that he wants to answer. That That is his thing, isn't it? So I, I quite enjoyed him sticking the boot in. Yeah. But wasn't that also praising Xavi? Yeah. Because, I mean, he was, he was a central part of that yeah. success, right? You wouldn't have it without... It was like, well, yeah, like, you want fuck all the parts <laughs> Yeah, I, Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's praising uh, Xavi of yesteryear, not Xavi of this year. You, you, yeah, right, I suppose, in that way, it's, you used to be something. Exactly. I was there when you were something. You, a, you, were, you were really quite good, weren't when, you? When, when, when you weren't a manager, and I was obviously a manager, yeah. and I managed you, um, you just basically need to listen to me, young man. That's what you When people doing. didn't realise how little you were because you were standing in the middle there, <laughs> people loved you. He basically just used to, might as well have just gone, young man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been the end of it. I mean, obviously, there's something quite tone deaf about mm. him sort of saying well obviously we represent uh, Barcelona more than more than you do because we've got loads of money and you haven't got any <laughs> yeah um well. what about uh, Jaden Sancho's Borussia Dortmund Andy any chance for them you know what they were a much better cup team than they are a league team yeah so I, I i i don't i don't think that's to be ruled out well of, of course edin terzic has mainly succeeded mm. in cup environments beforehand so yeah. i strongly suspect he won't be at borussia dortmund next season but um Champions League final would be quite a nice way to sign off. It wouldn't be bad. Um, well, Luke and I will be recording a Ramble Reacts tonight following those uh, two games. Do follow us on Spotify so you never miss uh, an episode. So, yes, a, a European, very much a European flavour for Luke and I to get our teeth into, so don't uh, miss out on that one. Uh, now, before we go, we should say that on Monday we discussed journalist John Cross being annoyed that a supercomputer kept changing its mind on who would win the league. Um, now, we should inform everybody that AI has now predicted every Champions League winner until 2103, which is quite hard to say because mm. it's. Um, I won't be here for it, quite and frankly. Sort of speak Great. for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Very arbitrary point to stop at as well. It, it is. <laughs> well, presumably that's the year that, that Andy Brassel will um, stop being a vegan or whatever you are, Andy. You know, <laughs> or whatever you are. <laughs> Speaking of changing his mind. Um, uh, so it's predicted, that, and we know AI is is you know it's very very sophisticated these days. And who are we to go against it? Quite frankly, um, it's predicted that Manchester United will win it next season. <laughs> <laughs> I for one welcome our machine overlords. Yeah. Uh, now there's there's this is probably a good point to change your mind, supercomputer. I was about to say they can change their minds. Um, there's a few reasons why I don't think that will happen. One is the main reason is because Man United won't be in the competition, and I don't really need any other reasons because that one's so sound. It's also <laughs> predicted um, that uh, that 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 Brentford and Newcastle United would win it in that time. I don't think that's an, a wild prediction on Newcastle, but Brentford will be delighted with that. Uh, but not Arsenal, Jim. <laughs> that's, that's the team that are, are still alive in the in latter the stages of it are not in... in, in yeah, I... Uh, uh, switch them off. Switch the machines you know off. The, yeah. You know the funny thing about this? Where's is, John Connor? <laughs> <laughs> and as John someone, Cross. As someone who gets uh, loads of these kind of PR emails all the time, uh, you only get them because they're, like, outlandish. Yeah. yeah. And the idea that they're using a supercomputer uh. to do this... Rather than the umpteen other things that need done, like Paul the o- could be could be of some interest in the world. <laughs> Paul the octopus and the mail of just called it hook, line, and sinker. Be like, oh yeah, fans left stunned by this. <laughs> no journalists left fooled by this. It was better when we just had an octopus telling well, us football I would, results, wasn't it? I'd love to meet yeah. the fan who's been stunned by this. Yeah, but have you seen this? <laughs> Brentford are going to win the Champions League. I'm fucking hell. What? It, it was, it's Thomas Frank. <laughs> he just signed a massively long contract. He's thinking, right, I'm around for this. Oh dear. But that's the beauty of football, everybody. We don't know until it happens. Thanks for watching a clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a video. And if you're feeling extra generous, why don't you like this video? Why don't you like this video?